Hey everyone, welcome back to the Hardware News Recap for the week. In this one, we've had about the busiest week that we could have possibly had in the hardware world. NVIDIA had its new RTX 30 series announcement. We've gone over those in depth on the channel, but we've got some additional information today as the follow-up coverage has continued. Intel announced something. We're still figuring out what that is. I'm told that it's not the R74800U, though. And then other updates, like the Steam Hardware Survey, which has some interesting stats on RTX, mostly that it's off. Before that, this video is brought to you by Arctic Cooling and its Liquid Freezer 2 line. Arctic is actively restocking its Liquid Freezer 2 coolers that rank among the top performers for CPU coolers right now, including on Ryzen CPUs. The Liquid Freezer 2 series is focused on high thermal performance and value featuring a blackout design and including a VRM fan mounted on top of the pump block to help provide airflow over neighboring VRM heat sinks. Arctic has also started selling its P12 120 case fans. Learn more at the links in the description below. So first up, a quick GN news item on store.gamersnexus.net. We have finally restocked the GN toolkit. A lot of you have been asking about it in one stream after another and on Twitter. It's finally back. It's been about a year now since we ran out of stock of these and we've completely updated the design and finally gotten some more in. A quick warning here too, we're already under 10% remaining after a day on sale from our previous video. So these will probably sell out within a few hours of this news video going live. If you order and it says add to cart, that means yours is shipping this week. After they sell through, we'll open up back orders for them and it'll say back order on the page with the expected dates listed on the store page. So sorry this stuff keeps selling out so fast. We're doing our best here, but thank you for all the support. When we first made these, we spent most of a year doing quality testing and endurance testing on the tools. And now we've spent about another year on refining them with four months alone on making new molds for the tools. Our goal with the GN toolkits is to provide something that'll last a long time. One, because it reduces waste, and two, because we like the idea of a PC toolkit that can be used for all of your system builds and most of your component teardowns. We have 10 new molds for all 10 of the tool handles. The basic shape and ergonomics have remained, and they were highly liked, so we left them alone, but we've updated a few important things. One of them, we have now permanently etched the GN logo on one side, and then we put tool labels with the icons for the tool on the other side embedded in the rubber. So you'll know exactly what the tool is at a glance, and they'll stay there even with heavy use of the tool over time. One of the small changes we made was repositioning the labels so they're always visible when you use the pegboard hole to hang the tools on the wall. This is a really small thing, like just getting the text so that it is easily legible off of a pegboard. It's, it's not like that's a, a major feature most people would talk about, but it's one of the small quality of life things that we improved with this round since we kind of nailed it really with the tool quality in the first round. So we're really working on just overall improvements like that. One of the larger changes we made was updating the hex head further. Previously, we had the outer diameter of the head ground down so that it would clear small capacitors and other small surface mount devices on video cards and other PCBs. And it's still ground down, but we ground it down even further while maintaining the structural integrity so it'll clear even more components now while working on stuff. And then also we uh, flattened, we shaved down and flattened the end of the hex head so you can get the socket closer to smaller hex screws which with some really tiny devices uh, has been pretty useful for us. This one isn't like a structural change, but it's something that I personally really cared about. It was something that I, I kind of had a personal vendetta against uh, single use plastics in our products to the extent that we can eliminate them anyway, reasonably. So we were able to, by updating the mold, which cost a lot of money, uh, we were able to improve things like the handle where the text is permanently on there, but we also, the catalyst for wanting to update the mold for me anyway, was to get rid of the single-use plastics because we needed a single-use plastic bag to protect the 10 tool handles and shipping. And now that we've updated the mold to basically naturally protect itself in shipping, we didn't need the bags anymore. So we got rid of 10 single-use bags in the kit and then the containing bag we've just replaced with a, a resealable bag. You can use it for something else if you want. That's just to make sure the tools all stay in place during shipping. So really happy with that change. Uh, the list of tools is on store.gamersnexus.net if you want to pick up the toolkit or learn more about it. That includes 10 tools, so uh, Philips 1, 0, uh, double zero, and triple zero. That'll handle really small devices. Custom hex heads for 5 millimeters and 4 millimeters. Allen keys for 1.5 mil, 2.0, and 2.5 mil, and then Torx 6. As for the materials, it's the same as last time, so they're still made out of the CRV steel, which is for strength and uh, long-term use for eight of the tools, and then the two hex heads are made out of an A3, 
which is so that we can customize them. Anyway, you can grab one on the store. They're on store.gamersaccess.net. Thanks for letting me talk about it for a few minutes at the start of the show. It's been a year of progress to finally get these back in. A hell of a fight by the team to get everything manufactured and updated with new molds and everything. So we're very proud of it and happy uh, to put it back out there. All right, let's move on to the first big news item. First one is about AMD and RTX GPU presence in Steam's hardware survey. Steam's hardware survey is obviously not all-encompassing, despite that being the ultimate goal of Steam to rule the world, uh, unless it has a, a number three in it somewhere, then they don't want anything to do with that. But the latest Steam hardware survey from August is now available. And in light of NVIDIA's upcoming RTX 3000 series, we thought we'd take a look through it and check out what the market distribution is for things like the RTX 20 series that came out with the RTX debut. And it seems clear why Turing cards got snubbed by NVIDIA in its keynote announcing the 30 series and why Pascal was sort of elevated and used as the, the marketing point of trying to lure people away from Pascal and onto the 3000 series. The reason we think that it got snubbed is because of the data you can see in Steam's hardware survey. RTX 20 is woefully underrepresented in the survey, for NVIDIA anyway, and outside of just the video card placement, these surveys also tend to highlight other interesting trends, or lack thereof, amongst PC users. The surveys don't show the whole picture. For example, it can't see how many RGB LEDs you have in your computer yet. But the Steam poll does look at minimally thousands of users for hardware configuration, and the results provide a meaningful snapshot. Here are some highlights and key takeaways. Quad-core CPUs in the CPU section are apparently still king. They account for 45.76% of the survey. Most users, 41.21%, are still running 16 gigabytes of RAM, with only 9% having a configuration beyond 16 gig. This is still a major shift away from a few years ago, when 8 gigabytes was dominant. Today, if we expand the system RAM list on the hardware survey, you'll see that 8 gigabytes is trending down, by about the same rate as 16 gigabytes is trending up. 8 gig is now at 32%. Still, the most popular resolution is 1920 by 1080. That's the resolution which Steam says accounts for 65% of its user base. The next most popular is 1440p, 2560 by 1440, at a distant 6.59%. 1440p never quite got the same focus as 1080 and 4K, so it's in sort of a weird middle ground here. That said, 4K is not doing better. It's at 2.24% of Steam's polled user base, and up 0.01% since the previous period. Ultra-wide resolutions haven't moved much, or at all in some instances, looking at the 3440 by 1440 results. And perhaps unsurprisingly, 1366 by 768 is captured by 10% of the market, with minimal movement. This is indicative of a lot of laptop users on Steam, either playing lighter weight games or just using the Steam friends list. 8GB GPUs up next have overtaken 6GB GPUs in Steam's hardware survey, with a reported 22.7% of users running 8191MB of video memory. 6GB GPUs at 6143MB uh, are in at a close second, making up 21.69% of polled users. As for popular GPUs, it's still NVIDIA and it's GTX 1060 at the top, with 10.75% of Steam users owning the card, according to the poll. The GTX 1060 has long since been the most popular card among Steam survey participants, even though its share has been slowly eroding. That marks a, this time, a 0.46% decline since April's survey. Meanwhile, the most popular RTX 20 series card is the RTX 2060, at a distant 2.88%. The RTX 2060 has been steadily moving up since April, making a 0.32% point uptick in adoption. And the 2080 Ti, embarrassed by the recent 30 series announcements, accounts for less than 1% of Steam users. The RTX 20 stats are further complicated by the fact that Nvidia launched super refreshes not too long after the 20 series, but even if you start combining the super and non-super cards, they're not, it doesn't change that much. One interesting thing here though, is looking at AMD. AMD is barely in the top 10 for Steam's polled user base. My, it's not everyone, but it's still a pretty wide net. And that has the RX 580 in rank number nine, which was refreshed by the 590 later uh, and was a refresh itself of the RX 480. So after that, its next card is at rank 16. That's the RX 570. As for the 5700 XT, it doesn't appear until way down the list, somehow below the 2080 Ti, despite being about a third of its price. The 5700 XT has about a 0.88% uh, 
share of the polled user base on Steam. Next up is the first round of displays supporting the uh, NVIDIA Reflex technology that was recently shown following NVIDIA's RTX 30 announcement. As part of the NVIDIA RTX 3000 series announcement, it mentioned the new NVIDIA Reflex feature. We haven't spent much time talking about this yet because uh, it needed a lot more detail. So this is aimed at reducing the end-to-end -end system latency. And NVIDIA offered that its primary objective is to uh, bring down latency and to correct the sort of language that is used when talking about latency. Because the word latency means a whole lot of different things to different people. You can be talking about it at a mouse level, at a monitor level, at a game refresh level, server tick rate, things like that. Uh, so NVIDIA is trying to put some standardized terminology into place. And it's also using this as a means to market the new 360 hertz displays, because at some point you're definitely going to run into people saying, like always, well, but does it really matter? At, at what point can you really see the difference anymore versus just having a higher number? And so that's what NVIDIA is trying to leverage its testing to market towards. NVIDIA made it clear that the new Reflex feature would coincide with bringing new 360 hertz G-Sync displays to market. And now NVIDIA and its primary partners, that would be Asus, Acer, uh, Alienware, and MSI, they're all co-announcing this first round of displays targeted for later this fall. These are as follows so far. The, there's the MSI Oculux NX G253R, uh, the Asus PG259QN, forgive me for looking at the script for these names, and the Alienware 25, actually. We'll give them credit for that. That's pretty good. Uh, also, the Acer Predator X25. But it has an X, so it's instantly better than Alienware's 25 because Alienware's 25 doesn't have an X. Back to the drawing board for Alienware. Take years of development to figure out how to get that X on the box, but I'm sure they can do it. After learning more about NVIDIA Reflex, we now know it's composed of two primary components. There's the NVIDIA Reflex SDK and the NVIDIA Reflex Latency Analyzer, which you'll see more of on our channel soon. Of the SDK, NVIDIA states that this is, quote, a new set of APIs for game developers to reduce and measure rendering latency. By integrating directly with the game, Reflex Low Latency Mode aligns game engine work to complete just in time for rendering, eliminating the GPU render queue and reducing CPU back pressure in GPU intensive scenes. This delivers latency reductions above and beyond existing driver only techniques, such as NVIDIA Ultra Low Latency Mode. Regardless of how you feel about this overall, NVIDIA has also done some research papers that are genuinely very interesting on the uh, common response time at a human level, different type of la latency altogether, when looking at pro players versus varying skill levels of other players. Typically, uh, from what the presentation we saw was saying, it sounds like pro players can be in the testing published around 120 milliseconds for a response, whereas the gamers who are uh, experienced but not pros were in the 150 plus range. It's pretty interesting stuff. There's a, actually an IEEE study on this as well, if I rem remember correctly. So that's all uh, worth looking at if you're interested in sort of the science behind how people interact with the games. At a high level, it seems that the SDK is effectively taking what NVIDIA's low latency mode, or ULMB, does at the driver level, and it's trying to bake it more into a software solution. So the idea here is to speed up the overall rendering pipeline, and this is something we We'll be talking about a whole lot soon, but one of the more interesting aspects of this is that peripheral makers such as Asus, Logitech, Razer, uh, and SteelSeries will be offering mice that will allow for measuring the end-to-end uh, -end system latency and, and sort of enable you to measure the latency at different points in the pipeline. Up next is HDMI cable support for 8K. NVIDIA made a big deal about 8K gaming for its RTX 3090, something we'll hopefully be testing, but that brought about questions of cable support. In a follow-up Architecture Day event, NVIDIA noted that HDMI 2.1 enablement permits a single cable for 8K HDR TV support at 60 Hz. NVIDIA noted that previously an 8K monitor would require two DisplayPort cables for 8K 60 SDR or four HDMI 2.0 for 8K 60 HDR. But we are neither Jensen Huan nor Linus Sebastian, so we don't have the budget for these monitors immediately to test them firsthand. Moving to HDMI 2.1 support on the RTX 3000 GPUs, 
will eliminate the need for multiple cables to drive one display. And this is something, maybe we'll look into it, but looking at the 8K prices right now, there's a whole lot of other things I'd rather buy for our company and what we're doing than a monitor at this moment. But we'll consider it. The 3090, we want to test. Most people don't have an 8K monitor though. So you kind of, at some point you're just testing it just to test the claims, not necessarily for a wide range of people using it. Uh, up next, PC-specific CPU optimizations for Marvel's Avengers. Marvel Avengers launched in full swing this past week, and the reason it's in this news story is because of Intel's involvement. Intel recently revealed that it collaborated with Crystal Dynamics to make some CPU-specific optimizations for the game, and it's done this in the past as well. The optimizations, no doubt, focus on the physics engine for the game, given that Intel is currently working uh, more from a CPU standpoint, Intel's marketing highlighted these few key points. Quote, the force and shockwave of each special move will create more detailed rubble and debris. With every powerful blow, stomp, blast, or smash, you'll see more persistent armor shards in more detail flying in more pieces and places. And then finally, they noted, quote, with the optimal balance of cores, threads, and frequency, any interaction with water becomes a richer, more responsive experience. Water splashes and reacts as it naturally would in the real world. Uh, if it really just takes cores and, and frequency and threads, then, well, AMD should probably be fine with that too. But either way, neither Intel nor Crystal Dynamics divulged any real technical information on this. There is, however, a video that shows enhanced enemy and environmental destruction, as well as the improved water simulation. The video compares frames rendered with these settings on versus off, and the improvements seem to be present and noteworthy. Intel is promising to support this for the next two years. Intel has been quick to drop the ball on supporting things it has implemented for games. And it's also planning to work on GPU-specific optimizations for the game as well, presumably for the upcoming XE graphics. Uh, so we've seen Intel add features like this in the past. Whether or not you actually care about Marvel Avengers, maybe you are more interested in how the silicon companies support games. Overall, it's a thing that they do need to do, all of them. Uh, but in the past, we saw Intel add, for example, self-shading shadows in some racing games. I th think it was a Codemasters game, but it's been a while. Up next, Mellanox and Cumulus become NVIDIA networking. NVIDIA recently finished its $7 billion acquisition of Mellanox, and it seems to have wasted no time in integrating it into the company and rebranding it. Mellanox will now be known as NVIDIA Networking, and while NVIDIA hasn't expressly confirmed this, Mellanox's updated website, Twitter account, and uh, other branding more or less do. NVIDIA also has a new NVIDIA Networking Twitter account that merges Mellanox Technologies and Cumulus Networks. Mellanox was a major acquisition for NVIDIA and is setting them up even further for data center uh, deployments and business-to-business -business relations. Cumulus offers the Cumulus Linux OS for networking switches. As far as we understand it, it was purchased for an undisclosed amount by NVIDIA. And Mellanox has been using these uh, Cumulus Linux OS uh, deployments on network switches for a number of years now, since 2016 at least in its Spectrum line of switches. There's a quote on the NVIDIA networking Twitter page that reads, NVIDIA networking, formerly Mellanox Technologies and Cumulus Networks. Ethernet and InfiniBand solutions that are turning the data center into one compute unit. So with Mellanox and Cumulus both under the NVIDIA roof, uh, NVIDIA can scale its own HPC platform with not just its own GPUs, but also with a software stack and with networking. So it's, it is expanding in a significant way. If you look at the Ampere A100 announcement, you can really see, start to see this roll out. This was before the 3000 series and earlier in the year. So you can see the chips start to fall into place back then. RTX 3000 series, so there's really quick recap here. We have a whole video and an article on it if you want to read the article version of the initial announcement. We're going to recap just the basics. Uh, we'll put an aggregated specs table on the screen to, to help out if you maybe missed some of the initial coverage. This is really just meant to catch people up. If you know all this stuff, feel free to skip to the next one. So the most interesting aspect to us at least is the new cooling design for FE cards and what implications it will have. We've got a whole separate video talking about this. We suspect it'll add a new angle to the air versus liquid cooling debate as well, and we'll test this exhaustively. The RTX 3000 series will see NVIDIA reposition its product stack to reintroduce the RTX 3080 as the flagship. That's at $700. The RTX 3090, if you saw the $1,500 price tag and thought there's price creep again, 
Uh, that is not meant to be like a 2080 Ti replacement. It's meant to be, and they said this in the keynote too, a Titan class replacement. The key difference is this time, NVIDIA is allowing its partners to make RTX 3090s, whereas previously partners have been barred from making any Titan variations. So that's a big move. Uh, the Titan class card and its Titanic price tag to match will be in the $1,500 price point. We'll be launching uh, September 24th, as we understand it right now, with the 3070 launching in October sometime, probably first half, based on what we've heard from partners. The 3070 is supposed to be priced at $500 and is allegedly more powerful than a 2080 Ti. We've noticed that some of the uh, performance marketing slides have been stripped of their context or maybe were not provided enough by NVIDIA to begin with. It's, it's marketing, it's not really a surprise. Uh, where, and Jay will be talking about this in one of his videos too, but where the 1.9x number, that wasn't like two times the performance. That's not what that number means. That's a performance per watt number, and uh, you'll see on the charts that it's something like Turing at 240 or something watts versus Zampere at, uh, in the 100s being roughly equivalent, but that's Ampere doesn't run in the 100s for the cards that are out now. The 3080, 3090, those are going to be much higher power consumption cards. So you'll probably see, basically the, the point is you're going to see some convergence towards uh, the mean as the power consumption goes up. But anyway, that should hopefully kind of set some of that straight for people if you just caught the TLDRs online that were uh, largely grossly inaccurate by the community. Uh, meanwhile, yeah, so the RTX 3070, it was shown at $500, NVIDIA also showed Doom Eternal footage running at 4K with frame rates well above 100 FPS captured on an RTX 3080. And AIB partners have also announced several of their models as well, and we've covered those on the channel if you want to learn more about each of those. But we're going to be doing a lot of reviews, so uh, as usual, check back for the reviews to get hard data on where all these fall from third-party testing. Intel is up next. This is another quick recap, and if you saw our previous video on Intel, you can use the, the time bars on the left to jump to the next story. Intel finally took the wraps off of its much-rumored 11th Gen Tiger Lake mobile CPUs this past week. While the chips seemed impressive enough on their own, Intel couldn't seem to steer the conversation away again from AMD and its Ryzen 4000 series APUs. Let's talk about the naming. Intel's naming paradigms continue to get more convoluted as it's introducing even more product identifiers with Tiger Lake. To start, Tiger Lake will come in one of two packages, depending on the power target. There's UP3 or UP4. The UP3 package essentially succeeds the high-performance U series, aimed at 12 watts to 28 watt TDPs. The UP4 package, we shouldn't use the word TDP, Intel wouldn't like that. 12 watts to 28 watts, period. The UP4 package succeeds the Y series for 7 watts to 15 watts. And each package leverages a 10 nanometer super thin processing die, which we'll talk about more later, and a 14 nanometer I.O. die. Tiger Lake will use Willow Cove cores and integrated XELP graphics or Intel UHD graphics. You can see how that last sentence might sound ridiculous to someone who doesn't follow technology, but I can assure you that it means something. We'll put Intel's spec sheet on the screen because I don't know any of the names because they didn't even say them. They said one, literally one name in its whole hour and 15 minute long tech deep dive. Uh, AMD beat Intel to the punch when it came to PCIe Gen 4 on desktops, but Intel was keen to highlight Tiger Lake as the industry's first PCIe Gen 4 platform for laptops. Other connectivity options include Wi-Fi 6 and Thunderbolt 4. Tiger Lake focuses on a number of improvements over Ice Lake, namely in higher sustained frequencies, improved memory support, better graphics performance, and a renewed focus on power efficiency aimed at improving battery life. This is actually, despite all of the incompetence in its presentation, a major launch for Intel, uh, and Tiger Lake is a potential serious competitor in the notebook space. The arrival of Tiger Lake also marked some significant rebranding for Intel, like a, uh, as stated previously, a cacophony of unpleasant brass for its jingle, and also new logos. It's also rebranded the U and Y series, essentially, trotting out new logos as well for the Iris and the Core I series brands. It de debuted its Evo brand, which is not to be confused with Samsung Evo, because that uses capital letters, uh, and then also the Evo brand is, is coming in alongside a replacing Project Athena. Intel also replaced its company logo, and, uh, well, that's... The message has been lost on what Intel needs to do right now, is all 
we have to say about that. Team Group launched a 15.3 terabyte SSD at $4,000 is also. So Team Group has now officially taken the most expensive consumer, in quotes, SSD crown. Consumer. Uh, the company announced its newest line of spacious SSDs, and that's going to be called the QX series. This is inaugurated with the Team Group QX SSD, which will offer a maximum capacity of 15.3 terabytes at 2.5 inch form factor and on the SATA 3 interface. The QX SSD will use 3D QLC NAND from an unspecified vendor as of present and a Fizon E12 DC controller alongside it to map everything. Team Group plans to couple this with an SLC cache mode and DRAM buffer, uh, and Team Group is claiming speeds at basically the SATA interface to 560 megabyte per second read, 480 write, with a write life of 2560 total terabytes written with a three-year warranty. And Team Group's QX SSDs will be made for order apparently with a price tag of $3,990. goes perfectly with your 3990X CPU. So you can spend uh, about eight grand on two components. Finally, NVIDIA RTX 3000 series Reddit Q&A. NVIDIA recently hosted a Q&A on Reddit where it answered some common questions uh, about its upcoming RTX 3000 cards. We'll detail a few of those and the more interesting points from the conversation. One of the biggest sticking points that we've seen surrounds the fact that RTX 3080 will come with a 10 gigabyte memory buffer, which is one gigabyte less than the 1080 Ti. Most people seem to be hung up on the capacity difference here, ignoring the advancements that G6X should have over G5X. NVIDIA offered the following answer, quote, we are constantly analyzing memory requirements of the latest games and regularly review with game developers to understand their memory needs for current and upcoming games. The goal of 3080 is to give you great performance at up to 4K resolution with all these settings maxed out at the best possible price. NVIDIA says in order to do this, you need a powerful GPU with high-speed memory and enough memory to meet the needs of the games. A few examples, if you look at Shadow of the Tomb Raider, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, Metro Exodus, or a couple of others they name, running at, on a 3080 at 4K with max settings, including any applicable high-res texture packs and RTX on, when the game supports it, you get in the range of 60 to 100 FPS and use anywhere from four to six gigabytes of memory. We'd like to offer our own quick clarification on this too. A lot of people look at GPU-Z or some other monitoring tool, and GPU-Z is great. But they'll look at the memory usage metric in the software and think that that's actually the memory being used. But the way software works is it, these monitoring tools, they can't really tell you what's being used. They can tell you what's engaged, what's sort of been allocated but isn't necessarily in use. For example, there's some old Call of Duty games we tested, I think maybe Black Ops 3 was one of them, where it would engage basically all of the memory on the card. It would allocate it, request it, but wouldn't actually need it. In other words, you wouldn't see a performance or a graphics difference if you start bringing down the memory capacity in spite of a higher uh, claimed usage in software. A couple other quick ones. NVIDIA offered some clarification on whether Reflex was software, or hardware, or both. They said NVIDIA Reflex is both. They talked about the latency analyzer being a new addition to G-Sync processing that allows for end-to-end -end system latency to be measured, and also talked about the Reflex SDK for integration with games. And finally, RTX I.O. is also a talking point. NVIDIA said, RTX I.O. allows reading data from SSDs at much higher speed than traditional methods and allows the data to be stored and read in a compressed format by the GPU for decompression and use by the GPU. It does not allow the SSD to replace frame buffer memory, but it allows the data from the SSD to get to the GPU and GPU memory much faster with much less CPU overhead. It also talked about direct storage and a few other things, but you can check the Reddit thread for that. We'll have it linked in our show notes in the description below for sources and notes on all these stories. Thanks for watching. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net to grab the toolkit before it is out of stock again, or patreon.com slash gamersnexus. Subscribe for more. We'll see you all next time.